All right. Well, let's uh, let's do this. Um, I have an agenda on one of these. So, uh, does anybody have any topics that they wish to bring up for this meeting? Is there any pressing business? All right. Um, so we have some notes from uh, our side for uh, the API needs for specifying global lexicals, um, endowing a compartment with global lexicals that are not properties of the global global this. Um, and we also discussed um, creating an API that uh, uh, we discussed the semantics of propagating endowments to child compartments, um, which is well, I can I can give a summary on that one. And then uh, an issue that it would be great to discuss with this group of folks would be um, whether uh, whether we can or should introduce a new method to the compartment ABI that gives us. Uh, the module namespace object for the module exports namespace object for a particular uh, specified module before having imported it. Um, does anybody have any preference on the order in which we talk about topics or other topics? No, I'm good with this order. Cool. Um, good to see you, Cody. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Chip, if there's any one of these topics that you would like to take while I think about another one, <laughs> uh, you're muted. Yeah. Um, no, at, at, at the moment, I think I'm, I think you are more contexted on most of this since you've been soaking in it. Yeah, as, indeed. <laughs> And soak, soaking is the right word. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So the first one is the specification of a global uh, of global lexicals. Um, I think that what we would like to do is add uh, an option to the options bag for the compartment constructor that allows us to introduce global lexicals that are not uh, fields of the global scope. And the reasoning behind this is that there are uh, certain motivating cases like instrumentation, like, go ahead. Point of, point of confusion, when you say not fields of the global scope, I think that- oh, Global this, pardon, properties- Right, of the they're, not, they're not properties on, on, on the global this, they're actually just values in the global scope. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, to clarify, what we have so far is that the compartments, the compartments constructor accepts an endowments object. The endowments object contains properties that are copied onto the global this object um, as part of the construction of the compartment. Um, and this is not sufficient for certain motivating cases like um, instrumentation and metering um, because those need to be able to introduce certain uh, functions or objects into the global lexical scope that are not dis uh, that are not discoverable or enumerable on the global this in that compartment. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, these features uh, have two parts. One of which is a transform, which uh, rewrites the code so that, uh, based off of a static analysis, they can verify or prevent. Uh, the the contain the compartmentalized code from accessing um, certain variables um, that are in the lexical scope, uh, and then the other part of that is that they also need those things to be in a lexical scope and an all and definitely not on the global this because if it were on the global this they could defeat the um, they could defeat the compartmentalization. Can I um, ask a quick question? Because uh, it, it would be helpful. Um, can we point to one or two uh, examples available, like today, that that um, basically, um, um, you know, if you refer to test as a um, as a um, lexically available function in in your um, 
yeah and yeah so so is that never um um sorry is that traditionally or is it just uh, in certain uh, frameworks or you know testing libraries that they don't entry, they don't um add it to the global this um yeah um so there are well, so let's take an example um the, the, the first motivating example would be instrumentation for coverage analysis, right? Um, so if you were to write something like Istanbul or, um, uh, or the NYC library that's built around it, is everybody familiar with um, Istanbul or something similar? Um, the, or, I'm so, not. Okay, so uh, there, there's a tool called NYC, which does uh, which is used by TAP, and it's also and built on a library called Istanbul. And Istanbul um, does a source-to-source -source transformation of every module that a particular application or test suite uses, right? Um, and in that source-to-source -source transformation, every expression is expanded to have two parts, one of which is to increment a coverage counter for that particular part of the code, and then to do the thing that was originally written in the source um is like parenthesized comma expressions and what this allows you to do is without modifying any of your sources you can measure the coverage of particular lines and expressions in, inside of your code and then do like cyclomatic complexity analysis and things like that um so all all of your all of the co test coverage measuring systems are uh, in javascript are based on this or something similar in fact code coverage in all languages is based on something like this. Um, and uh, so, it, it, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So, um, cause um, over the past few years, I've been running away from tools that insist to continue to propagate what was very Zen with not having a module system. Um, but since we have a module system, um, and I write my code as a module, Babel or not, that's secondary. Mm -hmm. um, it is counterintuitive to say that we created a module system, let's bring stuff and, 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 and ways we did it before the module system, and let's take modules and make them no modules, and then let's tell people that, okay, you know, I use source uh, map mojo, and then this is where the coverage was, and this is... Um, I, I really believe that we encourage legacy and legacy, if it doesn't stay up to date with features of the language, um, it creates, um, like, in my opinion, and I'm so sorry, I'm very, very emotional. I shouldn't be. In my opinion, you write a, a JavaScript module, you test that module without transforming it. You benchmark it without transforming it. You want to transform your code and benchmark it. Go ahead. Those are not. No, but so 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 sorry to interrupt because uh, so so there has been uh, I sent a link uh, to the issue. Um, you, you're talking about the the use case. One of the use cases, but there are many other use cases for controlling the contour. That's the name that we use sometimes in PC39 for for this thing. And it's not only that kind of use cases in general, it is a, there is a desire to control the contour for certain things that you want to do in a compartment. And, and yeah, there yeah. have been historically, Dave uh, Herman has some ideas around what that API looked like. This is the stroma that he, he sent it a uh, while back. That's uh, probably yeah, four years ago, <laughs> a long time ago, but basically, um, the fact that sometimes you do want to control the contour, especially yeah. around direct eval, indirect eval, there are certain subtleties there that you might want to prevent people from accessing certain values. Or even if you're writing, the example that he always used was mostly around, what if we write a, 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 a new grammar for the language? You're trying to do something new in the language that is not allowed. Uh, because the implementers has an implement that and you want to have a compartment that does support a new syntax. By so just as a feature, a, I absolutely, I absolutely um, see, see where it can be used. Like for the, 
especially when you, when you just said, you know, direct and indirect at all, um, I definitely, we need, we need a feature of the language that allows us to say, listen, there's this global property, but if you call it, I can shadow this and give it a different behavior somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, so, so definitely this kind of feature should be part of the language. Um, um, and, you know, the fact that eval has that magic is absolutely, um, so, so yeah, sorry, sorry to tangent on, on tooling, uh, but, but yeah, like definitely, you know, completely calm now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was going to say tooling is, is kind of the, the essential point here, which is, um, without the ability to do this kind of manipulation to the, um, uh, the global namespace, the something like the code coverage thing that Chris was talking about um, just isn't possible at all. And there's nothing since it, it, it it's kind of its very nature is to violate the the semantics of the module framework. Um, it's not like you're using it as you're using um, uh, the non-module thing is as you know, it's not, it's not, we're not trying to deal with a compatibility issue. We're trying to deal with a fundamental semantics issue. Yeah. So in, in that case though, like I, I, I considered for, for tooling specifically, I want to import from bare specifier uh, and be able to take that in the browser, run it in node, bare specifier has a meaning defined somewhere, any module importing from that bare specifier, it gets, um, uh, an instance of those functions that it could then say this instance was given to that module. That so that scenario, I believe, on a module level, makes um, makes um, you know an exciting future for 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 writing tests. Um, I, I hesitate from wondering if if giving a freely available um, um, global not property, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wonder if that, if that would discourage reaching modules that actually allow you to instrument each module with a particular test function so that when test is called from one module, when coverage functions are called in one module, you're actually collecting the, the data related to that module. Um, I, I think we're talking at cross purposes here. Um, um, part of the, the challenge that with, with something like uh, code coverage or uh, even more significantly uh, metering is you, you need to be able to impose the um, uh, analysis or, or, or control mechanism without the, um, the code that's being, being analyzed or metered to be able to determine that this is happening uh, and to, to change its behavior accordingly, either to uh, um, manipulate the, um, the mechanisms directly or, or to change its behavior um, to give a, a, a faulty reading. Does the module system not already uh, give this functionality? Because instead of giving a, a contour variable, whatever you call it, you could provide the compartment with access to some special module that the transformers It's not about giving the, the compartment access. It's giving the compartment access in a way that the code that you're loading into the compartment can't know about it. Um, what if it were, I mean, this, this sounds maybe a little bit hacky, but if the, if you generated a GUID or something for the, for the uh, module name that you're injecting, um, yeah. the code can't guess that compartment specifier. It right, it, yes. that, that, that hinges on the, the code not being able to enumerate the names, uh, which if it's on the global object, they can. So, uh, yeah, but uh, if it's a module, then it, uh, actually, if, you, if, you, if you're using the modules, then it's not on the global object, so it's not enumerable. Correct. Um, Right. V8 actually, actually does this right now um, when you generate anonymous modules. Um, you can see this in browsers if you put a debugger statement in your repo, for example. 
um, the only way that you can prevent people from obtaining this is basically the same thing that browsers and node does is we don't let you directly get a hold of that. It's a similar idea here. We simply won't resolve to that module specifier ever. So even if you guessed it, you couldn't get a hold of it because there are privileged variables in there, particularly for browsers, they're afraid of clipboard access. So a similar idea is going on here where we have these globals and we want them to truly not exist within a way that the code inside of a realm or compartment is able to access something they're not supposed to be able to get to. But the idea is sound, what you're saying, where if we put it to a module specifier, um, we can hide things, but even that, it just mirrors what we're talking about right now. So I feel, I feel like what we're seeing is we're inside whatever place where code shouldn't access something, we're doing curly braces somewhere, and in there we're doing a bunch of consts and lets, and then you really can't get so, so you're you're, and you know you're making them accessible within a closure, um, that is inside the, you know, one, one level down from the closure that you're in, um, and 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 so if you're in an if statement, you do those curly braces, and then all the code in that if block is not able to see what you're doing inside that little closure. Um, is that is that more more like the scenario or well let's say you just you want to count the number of times um, the code does something and so you you transform the code into something which will increment a counter every time it does whatever the something is you want to count um, you want the code itself not to be able to know the name of that counter variable um, because otherwise it could manipulate it. Yeah, but a bound closure, like like a with with proxy statement inside wherever part, um, uh, that means that variable doesn't even get defined in the scope of, of that code. It gets defined in the with statement um, as long as you can pass the proxy to it without making it accessible to the code uh, through exactly. uh, an eval. Exactly. And are are the, we talking about how to solve the problem? Or are we talking about ooh, modeling? I'm confused it. about what, what are we um, going I, down the rabbit hole on this one? I guess we're just modeling the behavior with JavaScript um, uh, things. Um, to, to just agree on the concept being discussed more, more you know, in a sense. So I, that's at least what I try to do or I'm trying to do. Sure. I think for me, um, I, I'm wondering if there's going to be a resistance to adding this as a feature, um, if there already exists ways of achieving it, whether it's through, uh, you know, uh, like you're saying, like wrapping in a closure, you know, injecting, injecting names like they like require and module are done um, in, a, in a common JS um, uh, transformation. Yeah, I, um, I, so or with a that's good. A, mm. that, that's a good, uh, that's, that's a good point. And I will add to that, uh, there is indeed uh, a, a, independently of whether or not you can do it today and how you can do it today with the fundamental uh, uh, idea of controlling the contour, there are uh, resistance inside the committee about some of the semantics of what the of the things that are bind um, bindings in the in the in the contour, and we just don't know how to resolve them yet. And there is one from Dave in the issue that I sent, but there were more than that when we discussed it in the past. I'm talking about four years ago. Um, so there was a, 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 a or, or people in the committee at the time entertaining the idea of controlling the contour, having an API to control the contour, 
but there were semantic problems that have to be resolved before we can even get to the point where we can get people to agree on it. If I can bring up one more, um, I've pasted something into the chat here. Um, I, this, well, this, this is a, an, an issue on the JC, um, on the JC repository. Um, and it's talking about importing this uh, protect and suspect uh, methods for controlling the boundary between modules. And there's a, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's perhaps some overlap here in that, uh, you know, this is importing from a module something that, um, you know, might be better represented as a, as a contour variable. Um, uh, just, yeah. just another scenario. Yeah, and that's the, the technique that we, we use it, the, the same technique and based it on, on also what Chris was saying, the, the fact that it is a module and you can do a static analysis on what they access from the, 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 the code that they have and importing things with names that uh, you know they are not trying to access via the bindings of the module then it's easy to implement something like this where you don't really care much about um, uh, then, then trying to access it. Uh, and if they try to use a, a, a direct eval, they do have access to it. That's the main problem here. If I have an eval in line, in line after the cons full, have an eval there that access protect on suspect, I will be able to access that. That's the main situation. Mm. And I think that's what, what, what Chris and Chip were trying to say, that there are fundamental issues today to achieve that. Um, and, uh, but but, the, but the, same, the same applies to the contour, right? Like if you have an eval there, the contour will have the exact same problem. So this solution is equivalent to controlling the contour by bringing bindings that are specific as a result of the compilation process. Yeah, agreed. The, uh, uh, to, to back up, um, I brought up the code coverage analysis as a sort of introductory example for its understandability, but what we're trying to get to is something more like metering or, um, uh, or related features. And for those, um, unguessability is, is not sufficient. It is necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, unforgeability is necessary for those cases. It shouldn't. Uh, it should not be possible for somebody to um, to guess and gain access to the uh, to one of these capabilities. Um, and the and the trans the source to source transform is one of the um, one of the tools that we have in our disposal um, in order to ensure that the source uh, that, that that the source, if it were to happen to even refer to uh, the the same name by coincidence we would simply rewrite their source to use a different name. Yep. Yeah, I, I, and this one is not forgeable anyway, so this one is fine. It's discoverable but not forgeable via eval, direct eval. Um, say again, I think that we're saying the same thing, but I'm not sure. Uh, what I'm saying is that the, the example in the screen right now, well, uh, in my screen at least, the uh, import protect suspect from yes e standard. That's the one that I'm looking at mm -hmm. from the chat. Uh, the, the, the example there where you use transpilation source to source to bring a new binding, the binding that you're bringing is not forgeable. You cannot change that uh, in a way that will affect anyone or anything. And uh, it is discoverable via eval. So it's, is discoverable but not forgeable, and the, the question is whether or not that is sufficient for what you need. Um, for uh, Chip, you're talking but muted. I, I'll let you go. No. Um, no, no, I wasn't trying to say something. Although I was having a thought, so I may have been talking <laughs> to myself. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the thing is, is discoverability. Well, the issue is not discoverability. The issue is access. Um, um, you know, she wants to deny access, and 
um, to, to, you know, not to the code that, well, the problem is, is you have code that is a result of transforming user code and um, your transformation may make reference to this name, but you don't want the user code to be able to make reference to the name. Um, but 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 this discoverability means you can call it. You cannot forge it, but you can call it because right. you can do a direct eval that access from the contour uh, or from the in this case the module environment. So can I throw a, a like a wrench into this? Um, the way we're visualizing it is: let's say I make a function called um, 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 function A. Um, and I want that to be a privileged um, thing that only code that I inject into the source can call it. Um, but I'm actually running it on a source that calls their own function A. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what I keep running into every time I end up doing a with closure proxy um, uh, solution because no matter how you think of scope in JavaScript, if it's in the scope and has odd behavior, you can't police user code. And you can't say, well, your user code, uh, I'm going to rewrite one of your variables. Yeah, you can't. But you can't because you have to now analyze whether or not there are evals, whether or not there are... Once, once you clash with a variable name, and the argument whether or not you can rename variable names, you can't. People do it, but you can't. Um, you know, um, you can't safely do it unless you analyze so much code. And by the end, you're done. It's basically going to be an issue that is opened on your repo after you release, and it will be um, patched somehow. Um, so if you're not going to rename function A, and you have your own version of fun function A that nobody else should call because um, it's different. Are, Bella, are you proposing that the, that if you were to inject something where A was privileged, that the person who published a library that used the name A would have to rewrite their own source? No, no. I'm, I'm saying that my A and their A should never exist on the same uh, lexical planes. Oh, okay. So I, I want to jump in here with how the metering actually works right now is we are use, we're using a symbol that no same person would actually use. It has a zero width joiner and it has various prefix on it. If we detect this variable in, in the user source code, we simply reject the source code. We do not do any rewriting. We do not try to be fancy in that sense. So by doing that, uh, and the, the idea of an eval somehow escaping that doesn't happen because the eval is all subject to the same transform. Sorry, can you explain the eval thing again? How, how, do you, so, how do you know that eval is not accessing it? Because the compartment rewrite, rewrites already what eval accesses. It changes, it, it changes eval into something different. But that's a, and that's what's the different that, thing that has the behavior that cannot access the, uh, what the, the contour variables? It's a version of the evaluate function that applies the source to source transformation on any proposed program. The, the, uh, so I'm jumping in the middle here. Uh, Chip gave, did a brief chat for me. Uh, so I don't know if uh, what I'm saying uh, fits the conversation or not. But the key thing about the, uh, the JavaScript global lexical scope, as opposed to the JavaScript global scope, is if a value is bound to a variable in the JavaScript global lexical scope, the only way that that, that code can access that variable in order to introduce that value into computation is by mentioning the name of the variable. For the global scope, because the global variable names are alias to properties on the global object. And you can look up properties of the global object uh, by a computed name in square brackets. Uh, we can't, uh, that same safety property does not exist. So if you control the variables that are mentioned literally 
in source text you're about to execute, uh, then you do have control over what variables uh, that were introduced into the global lexical scope that hold dangerous things. Uh, you do control access to those dangerous things. Right, but we we add to 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 add to that the direct eval is a problem, and this discoverability and access to them via direct eval is is indeed a problem. Uh, okay, so di direct eval. I'm glad you raised that. We did not. Uh, we have not talked about direct eval in this context, and the reason we haven't talked about it uh, is because uh, it is impossible. Uh, simply flat impossible for a shim to support direct eval. Yeah, um, but even and, by the proposal, but the proposal. So the proposal, we, we the are proposal, sort of a, yeah, we, that's we're sort right. of the jumping between. Yeah, the proposal the, absolutely has to support direct eval, and probably the XS engine has to support direct eval. It's only impossible as a shim. Yeah, but uh, so. Just to clarify for, 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 I mean, my perception is that we're jumping between uh, what, what, what we want to propose and how, and the current, uh, the team implementation and how you can achieve something today, similar to what you're trying to propose. Um, my, uh, I, was, uh, I also mentioned, Mark, just to get you up to a speed, that in the past we did talk about controlling the contour. That's something that Dave Herman wanted to have. Right. Uh, we even have an issue that we close saying that the issue on the run proposal should be on the com on compartments. Um, and uh, it, four years ago, when we talk about it, there were some people who entertained the idea uh, and there were some concerns about the semantics of controlling and removing, especially on removing things from the contour or from the, the lexical scope. And, um, we never really get any traction there, but this is definitely something that we want to, to, to have. Now, that being said, I think that we need to be very, very careful. If we want to advance the compartment API. We don't want to make the same mistakes that the uh, decorators proposal and some other proposal have fallen into in the past. And if we don't go with something that is simple enough, and then uh, having a avenue for adding more features to it in the future, we're going to have a very hard time getting this into the language. That's just a tactical aspect of, of this. And uh, the contour seems to be something that we could achieve today via some transpilation and some other things that we could do. I, I imagine that if we do transpilation source to source, we bring a binding. That binding is in the module uh, scope. Uh, it's not forgeable. You cannot change it, but it's discoverable via direct eval. And then we can play with the hooks that we have for direct eval to disable access to those by maybe, I think if we replace eval with the new function that is also direct eval, uh, we, we could add some bits at the beginning saying this is a, there are some lets and some cons here, uh, that, uh, some cons here set to undefined that you will not be able to access from within the code that you're evaluating. So there are a bunch of things that we could do if we're doing transpilation to disable the discoverability of these bindings that will get us very far. Uh, right. And the key, uh, the, the, key, the key thing about what you said is that the bindings are in lexical scope, not global lexical scope yeah. by a mechanism, but from what you said, uh, introduced in the lexical scope by rewriting. But nevertheless, the key thing is that they're in the lexical scope. They're not in uh, the scope that's aliased to global property names. Right, and then uh, we could say that this feature can be something that we can add in the future. And we have now a path forward that we can achieve the same thing without having to require this as an MVP of the compartment API. That seems reasonable, really. We, uh, and you're proposing that we um, postpone the proposal of an, of a, uh, an option for global lexicals 
um, in order to avoid political entang entanglements in the first the first right. Of department's proposal. I, I, that, that doesn't preclude us from having a discussion around it and maybe even de describe a potential solution that is equivalent in functionality, like the transpilation plus eval, direct eval, monkey patch which should be possible in the compartment API to have all the properties of what we want, which is non-forgeable, not discoverable, not callable, so you, and only you can use that thing. So, uh, so I'm largely in agreement, but, but with qualifications. Um, the, uh, as I understand the stage two entry requirements, um, uh, we don't, have to have um, a complete API coverage of all, of all the functionality that we say needs to be in the proposal. Um, uh, uh, so, the, so leaving out a concrete API uh, from the stage two proposal, uh, but I'm not okay leaving out the clear statement that we intend to include the functionality uh, in the proposal before stage three or you know, in order to go for stage three. And the reason is that a major motivating, stated motivating goal for compartments and a criteria to hold up any compartment design against is host virtualizability. And since the global lexical scope is an inescapable part of host virtualizability without rewrite. Um, uh, with rewrite, you can achieve anything by uh, the Turing trap. Uh, and um, as, as you know, and it's the without rewrite that was also the thing that en enabled the hardware designers uh, ages ago to say precisely what it means to have a virtualizable architecture. Um, uh, x86 is not virtualizable because VMware has to rewrite in order to virtualize. Um, uh, so I think that that's still a good engineering goal and criteria to state for the proposal. There's a number of things that are required to achieve that, that we're not going to work out a concrete API for uh, immediately. Um, uh, so that's, uh, but, but the, the tactical issue of saying, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. I'm, I'm completely in favor of that. Um, the uh, other thing is that with regard to direct eval, what you said reminded me that at once, as we were proposing host hooks, that this was back in the days before we had, um, before we divorced realm and compartment back when they were uh, more together as one API, um, uh, we had a hook uh, that I think we need to revive as part of the compartment proposal, which is what we call the is direct eval hook. Uh, and the is direct eval hook uh, uh, lets us hook the part of the spec that tests is this function the original eval function? So, so just to, to bring everybody up to speed on this incredibly bizarre part of the spec, um, uh, the, in order for a code, in order for a direct eval to happen, um, uh, uh, the code must pass a static check and a dynamic check. Uh, the static check is that it simply looks like a direct eval. Um, so to a first approximation, um, the identifier eval, open for an argument, so just a simple function call. It's not quite so simple because um, uh, uh, lexical variations like surrounding the name eval directly in parens still leaves it as the syntactic form of a direct eval but surrounding it, for example, an open paren one comma eval close paren means that it no longer qualifies as direct eval. So that's the static criteria. Uh, 
the dynamic criteria is that in this scope, the name eval is looked up as a variable name. And uh, the value that is looked up is then tested against the original eval function, the, you know, the intrinsic original eval function. And if it's the same, then the statement is executed as a direct eval and uh, without invoking the function. Uh, and if it is not the same, uh, then uh, the, um, uh, then the function is invoked uh, it, as if with a normal indirect eval, it's simply invoked as the function call that it looks like it is. Whatever was between the parens just gets passed to it as function arguments. Um, so we do need to revive the is direct eval hook, but that's not adequate as you point out because that doesn't give us the rewrite. So there is another part of the hook proposal that I think goes all the way back to Dave Herman, which is um, uh, any string that would have been direct avowed is first handed to a rewrite hook, which gives it the chance to rewrite it. And only then the rewritten string gets direct avowed. Now, at that point, we have fallen off the criteria of virtualizing without rewrite, uh, but that would allow at least censoring uh, any code that mentions this fu these funny names. Um, uh, so that's, that's everything I had to say. Uh, yes, so um, the most of it was a spec it was deleted from the round proposal, but we can go back in history and see the, the two hooks that we have and the specification for them. So we should bring it up easily into the compartments uh, spec. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the rewrite part of it, we never did the rewrite of the source, but it was definitely possible with the, with the hooks that, that we had at some point, we, we, we could just go ahead and, and do that again. That should be easy. Yeah, this was only a specification issue because once again, uh, this is impossible to implement um, uh, uh, in the shim. So um, just, just as we were talking, I remembered the word zones. Um, that was, yeah. Um, but forget about what, what, what and who and all of that, you know. Uh, let's talk practicality. Like I've, um, I've thought of, of, of the way, you, you, you know, you would shim this today is basically an iffy call, but like you somehow endow that iffy function. Um, and um, I, I, I think it really should not clash with the scope. So you're, you're going to be prefixing any references to those um, um, you know, free floating variables with this dot and then any vars you would define in that function would basically be on your local list, which nobody has uh, reference to, um, started looking like zones. <laughs> and maybe for very different reasons. Um, but um, yeah, so, so, so I, I think this is definitely, I don't know. <laughs> So uh, I would, um, that sounds like something to investigate. Uh, I would, uh, I think uh, if we're, if we don't need to implement this in the shim, and given that it's at least extremely hard to implement it in the shim, uh, what I propose is that we go forward planning not to implement it in the shim, uh, but we still need to propose something. And the proposal should be a proposal that makes sense without requiring a rewrite. And for example, uh, Michael's point about censoring would, uh, 
uh, would be adequately served by simply running a regex over the source text before allowing it. Um, uh, the, uh, so I want to also mention an opportunity here, which is back when we had the is direct eval hook, uh, the direct eval rewrite hook, that was before uh, CSP caused us to add a host hook for deciding whether to allow any evaluation at all, and before Mike Samuel uh, proposed enhancing that host hook so that he could do uh, his type something or other. Um, so I think that we could probably, trusted types, thank you, um, uh, that if we keep all of these use cases in mind, uh, what we should try to do is figure out what is the minimum set of hooks to propose that deals with all of these cases. Uh, and because the cases really are very similar. They're basically saying, before actually doing a direct eval, uh, give the host an opportunity to intervene. Um, and right now that's mainly intervene for purposes of preventing it, uh, but it uh, could also be to intervene for purposes of deciding whether it's a direct eval um, or whether at least the function qualifies as being a candidate for direct eval, uh, as well as the potential to rewrite the text, neither of which is part of the current proposed hooks. Yeah, the reason I say that the regex is adequate uh, is because Michael is pro proposing to combine two safeguards. One safeguard is placing the variable in the global lexical scope. Uh, the other safeguard is spelling it in a way that you really never have to worry about an innocent accidental collision. Um, uh, even appearing in a literal string or a comment. And that's why we can, uh, that, that's why rejecting it based on a regex rather than a full parse is a reasonable piece of engineering here. Uh, whereas uh, the current things that we reje reject with regex like HTML comments um, uh, do, do fail safe, but they fail safe at the benefit of rejecting many innocent, uh, many innocent accidental collisions. Yeah, no. so in, in practice, we, we probably still need something more than a full, full um, than a regex scan for the, uh, the metering transform, at least, because we have to detect okay. other kinds of other kinds for of situations as well. For the transform, yes. Uh, but uh, endowing uh, the trend, endowing transformed code with access to this while, I mean, for, for, for metering, this doesn't make sense, but as a general matter, oh, lost your audio. Much, okay, let me turn off my video. Uh, now with my video off, is my audio back? You're clear now. Okay. Um, so for the, for, the tr for the metering transform, uh, Michael is exactly right. It's, it's, we lose the purpose of the metering transform if we allow any untranslated code at all. Um, with regard to the general security benefit, uh, a, a potential security benefit that could be used outside the metering transform, uh, uh, the combination of 
uh, putting variables with extremely funny spelling into the global lexical scope uh, uh, together with this level of control over evaluation could allow safe rejection based purely on a regex, uh, which to my mind uh, uh, still qualifies for the spirit of host virtualizability. Uh, and most of all means that you, you can get away without including a, an accurate parser in your TCB. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first is, uh, I, I, direct eval is, um, is, is direct eval allowed in strict mode and in ESM modules? Y yes. Uh, di yes, di direct eval is allowed. Uh, here's something important uh, to know about uh, the interaction of strict mode with uh, the global lexical scope which is uh, right now there are, um, there's uh, two ways to cause a variable, cause the global lexical scope to be populated. Uh, one is a top level uh, const or let or class declaration uh, in script code uh, co your code evaluated, um, eval I'm sorry, I'm use not using the proper term. The proper um, spec term is evaluated as global code rather than evaluated as eval code. Uh, and so script tags, for example, are evaluated as global code. Uh, 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 anything fed to eval is only evaluated as uh, eval code. And uh, for uh, the TC53 and modable use cases for SES, uh, we decided that we do not need for, specific, for SES use specifically, we do not need to support evaluating code as global code. Uh, and uh, for code that's executed as eval code, if it's evaluated sloppy, then a top level const letter class can, will still populate the global lexical scope. But again, for the TC53 um, embedded use case, uh, we're definitely not proposing to support sloppy. On the other hand, for the compartment proposal, now that the compartment proposal has been divorced from success and has to be something that is coherent within the language as a whole, uh, we can no longer uh, ignore sloppy. We can no longer ignore evaluating code as global code. And therefore, we can no longer ignore the global lexical scope. Uh, it was very pleasing that, uh, that for TC53, by, by ignoring both um, uh, global code and sloppy code, uh, it turned out that uh, that meant the global lexical scope was effectively no longer part of the language anyway, so we could ignore it as long as we were, we were uh, ignoring those other two things. So I'm still confused about, I was, I was talking and talking and I realized I was mute. Um, before you start talking about this, uh, the 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 confusion that I have is that we we are talking about what we need to propose, and also sometimes the implementations is the same 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 confusion. So, Mark, you were saying that you absolutely see the necessity to have these as part of the stage three ways to control the 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 contour lexical code, uh, the yes. global lexical code. And, yes. and then you were talking also about the possibility that the hooks for eval and such um, can take us very far. And you can do a lot of things if you control the, the direct eval. Uh, mm -hmm. I assume that you're talking now about 
the current implementation that you could achieve by doing some of these, but I'm still confused. No, uh, the, the, the current implementation uh, cannot support direct eval in any form, or, or at least without a very invasive rewrite, which is what I, I take Solid to have been referring to. So then, then uh, what is the relationship between the, the eval hooks with the rewriting versus a API designated for controlling the, the global lexical scope? I think that they're independent parts of the language. Obviously they interact, but neither one subsumes the other. Uh, so in order to virtualize the entire language, uh, or in order to, sorry, in order to virtualize, um, uh, to have full, full, virtu full virtualizability of interaction with the host um, while preserving the semantics of the language, I think you ha we have to do both. Uh, but uh, the, the, sh the shim um, doesn't have to do um, both and you know if we don't need it doesn't have to do either one um, uh, and I think we can say uh, in stage two we're going to concretely propose the things that we're ready to concretely propose um, uh, and that's actually based on implementation and use experience uh, and the other ones are to investigate during stage two Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, uh, Calvert, you're muted. Let's uh, let's perhaps resume this. Uh, I don't think that we have anything actionable today. Um, so we can either bring this up or maybe we can come up with a resolution for how to proceed with this topic of global lexicals and also the conversation about direct eval. Yeah. I also just want to say for completeness, especially since you know, we're being recorded for the record, uh, that Sala and I did explore another way to implement direct eval in the shim. Uh, and that is a very, very careful scheme for swapping in and out uh, the original eval function um, uh, where it needs to be the lexical binding of the eval uh, in order to um, actually use the underlying host's direct eval function. I think that the scheme that Sal and I came up with uh, works in theory, but it's so delicate and the consequences of getting it wrong are so fatal that I'm terrified of trying it. Uh, but I do want to mention it for the for completeness. Well, and there, there, still... that's, that's actually posted in some issue somewhere so we can find it and post a link to it. Yeah, I, I hope that, uh, just, just a side note, I hope that we invest in this group more time looking at the uh, membranes and uh, the the things that we have on that we can achieve today with membranes and uh, detached iframes and uh, VMs in nodes because I believe you could still achieve uh, compartment uh, in a in a compartment that is a lot more closer than what we want from the from the language, uh, without sacrificing sacrificing uh, direct eval and a bunch of other features. The well, so, example is that what we do today um, for the 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 things that we are exploring, we have. Uh, sloppy uh, strict mode. We have direct eval, indirect eval. We have no issues, no issues at all with any of that. 
So, uh, so uh, Karuti, this is definitely in scope for these meetings, and we've spent, you know, many a lot of time in these meetings exploring exactly that, and I'm happy to 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 continue to do that, uh, including the question you're raising. Uh, but from everything I've understood about it so far, uh, that uh, the near membrane mechanism uh, is useful. Uh, and I look forward to exploring it, but it does not seem to me that it that it subsumes the functionality of compartments or even close. I think we still need compartments. Um, I think I think these are just very different. No, no, no. The, what I'm saying is that uh, for the current implementation of what you're doing, I, I believe uh, you could get very far to match what we are asking by using the, the membrane. Obviously, we do want the compartments and the language, but that's going to okay. be, uh, we'll have uh, the full range of features plus, it will be a lot faster than doing the membrane, near membrane implementation. I'm just saying that uh, as today you continue exploring, I think you're still using the, the width with the proxy, I guess. Yes, we're still using your eight magic yeah. lines. Um, and I, I believe you, you should be able to replace that with something that works uh, with the mem near membrane and it's going to be a lot more powerful than what you have and you will achieve a, a pretty much the same thing. Okay, yeah, I, would, I, would, I think it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, the kind of thing that this, that, you know, this series of meetings has explored and should continue to explore. Uh, so please do. I'm sorry, Calvert, it sounded, looked like you were trying to say something, but it sounds like you were muted. I'm affirming, affirming. <laughs> now let's fill in the schedule. Um, if I can transition to the second topic, uh, which I think that I can give a brief on very quickly um, before getting to the third. Uh, for, for one, does any, uh, is this a good time to segue? Yep. Um, we had some discussion amongst us at Agoric about uh, an API for endowments to propagate to child compartments. This, this is related to the motivation for the first topic. Um, we have convinced ourselves that the compartment API is, it is sufficient for us to have a compartment API where the only kind of endowment is the kind of endowment that is not implicitly inherited by any child compartment. Uh, so if you pass an endowment to a compartment and that compartment wishes for a compartment it constructs to also have that endowment, it must explicitly thread it through the compartment constructor for that child. Um, we have a need for the metering case um, and presumably also for the instrumentation case uh, for uh, ha uh, passing an endowment to a compartment that must be implicitly um, passed to all child compartments, but we convinced ourselves that we can achieve this by creating a decorator on the compartment constructor um, uh, such that some things uh, through, through another API outside of the compartment API, we're able yeah. to create endowments and transforms that okay. are implicitly yeah. passed. Yeah, just to, just to, 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 yeah, to avoid confusion, I just, when, when Calvert said decorator, he did not mean the decorator mechanism. He just meant replacing meant, it with a wrapper. Yeah, I, I meant the adapter pattern, which is called decorators Python. Eh. Yeah, there's a I, proposal called decorators, so we should probably stop yeah. using that term for Indeed. things which are not that proposal. So, so I'm Indeed. still uh, clarification. So what you're saying is that you, you must explicitly pass the endowments to any compartment that you create at any level. Yes. That's the, that's the proposal. Okay, I, I'm supportive of that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay. Oh, does that include censorship, like removals? Uh, the, um, so, the, uh, so first of all, after uh, a compartment is created, 
uh, the creator has access to the global before any code runs within the compartment. Uh, so this mechanism of uh, replacing it with a self-propagating wrapper could certainly do uh, removals as well as additions. Um, uh, with regard to what the compartment API itself directly supports, uh, the idea is that the uh, the global the, the globals that it populates the new global object with implicitly are only safe powerless globals, um, so that um, uh, any anything that you want to pass forward with power you have to do explicitly, uh, and uh, the assumption that there's uh, no need to, to, for the compartment API to go out of its way to support removal because the only thing that it implicitly added were things that uh, we had deemed to be powerless. Uh, that seems fine to me, but might be an ergonomic issue. We'll see later. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, just to, to clarify the direction for this is Basically, we want to come up with a library function that could be widely used that would just say, here's the way that I want to transform my compartment constructors in the future. And that could do censorship or it could do injection of uh, variables or even changing of some defaults and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it would be kind of like a general membrane mechanism, except specifically for compartments. Yeah, and the really cool thing about it is the way in which it's self-propagated. Yeah, um, uh, slight slight digression. Uh, can someone, uh, Bradley, perhaps, can you remind me whether uh, source to source transforms are part of the current proposal for the compartment API? They are not. Um, okay. They are part of Node's uh, loader hook API. Um, you can achieve it with what uh, is in the compartment API. It is prohibitively difficult is what we found um, in Node's loader API that we had to provide a transform. Unfortunately, a lot of people using the transform hook do a naive transform and they get bugs, but that's somewhat expected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my understanding is that we, uh, from the work that, from conversations we've had about module APIs that we, for, uh, for some features, we need a source-to-source -source transformation to, uh, to be part of the compartment API, but only for code that is uh, evaluated, not for code that is imported. Um, right, because the, imp the import hook is where the, the rewrite has to be done before the code is parsed, and therefore clearly has to be done inside the import hook. Yeah, okay. Um, the next topic was, uh, I have a proposal that I've made uh, on Bradley's repository for um, adding a module method to the compartment API that would allow us to obtain a module namespace instance for a module that has not yet loaded, um, such that a library could uh, assemble a graph of compartments without executing any of their modules. Um, the motivation I'm coming from for this is uh, that if we were to implement something like Lava Moat or um, or even just something that take that reads a package lock and creates a set of compartments, um, it would be it would I it would be ideal if it were possible to link two compartments without necessarily executing them, uh, executing the modules in any linked compartment. Um, and the mechanism that we have today so far for threading, uh, uh, to, for linking a module from one compartment into another compartment is to obtain a module namespace object and pass it into the module map of a compartment constructor. Um, and since there, uh, the, the, so from discussions with Mark, we arrived at the idea that we could just reuse the existing module map with uh, that accepts the existing module namespace objects. Um, but in order to do the linkage, we would need a new method. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on this topic? Um, we might get into some oddities here between the 
multiple specifier and using the first class module namespace objects for similar purposes. Um, at least when I was writing it, I was writing out full specifiers as a means to identify an exact module instance. There may be more, more than one full specifier that points to a single module instance, but there is never more than one module instance per full specifier. Mm -hmm. um, right, these things appear in the uh, range part of the module map, not the domain part. Uh, the, the module map is mapping from full specifiers to something, and the something um, uh, uh, after uh, we, you know, we went through rounds in this meeting and with the modable folk uh, is, the, uh, is either the parent full specifier, in which case uh, you're only using the static information from the parent and reinstantiating it in the current module, or a module namespace object, uh, but you're still locally naming that module namespace with a local full specifier. Uh, correct. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if we need the actual object reference or if we can get away with just keeping things as full specifiers. Um, accessing a module namespace object before you have anything loaded onto it seems odd to me. It, it would be it something that you should never be able to add a property to. Yes. Oh, you should never be, absolutely, you should never be able to add a property to it. The, the module namespace object is already in the spec uh, read only, not immutable uh, because of live bindings. Uh, but from the object, you can only read, you cannot uh, modify a property, and you certainly can't add new properties. Yes, my concern is you would. With this and cycles, you can necessarily encounter a case where you have obtained a module's namespace mm -hmm. before any bindings for its exports have been resolved. Therefore, you have essentially a module namespace object to, that does not have the binding properties on it yet. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is, that is you put your finger on exactly what's, what's weird about the proposal. Yeah, and, and just to add here, the, the main reason for this is that the code running within the compartment would never be able to detect the situation because that happens at a later stage. This is only like a pre preload stage before the actual code starts running, if it ever does. It does not seem problematic if that is actually checked, but if you're able to pass these to different areas. In particular, I'm concerned with um, if you encounter a case where you have two parallel graphs loading and the unpopulated module namespace is granted, act, is somehow referenceable from the other graph, then you could see it. Yes, there could, there are interesting timing issues with the, with the proposal. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing in this state is first class. Uh, so you can certainly write code which observes it in this state. Uh, it's just that when you're using them for purposes of linkage, uh, the, you're using them for purposes of, uh, it should be the case that the code within the linked graph can't see it in this state. Within a single graph, I would agree. Um, okay. I'm, I'm still unsure on why it needs to be the module namespace object, though. Uh, Let's why talk alternative be... designs considered. Um, and so uh, the this is this is one of of, of the possible designs considered. Another. Um, Another design would be to introduce another optional argument. Uh, okay, so let's first talk about uh, the one that you were speaking of uh, a moment ago, Bradley. You suggested, I believe, um, uh, linking compartments by full specifier. Uh, the reason that that isn't sufficient is uh, that 
full specifiers are not universally unique, um, that they can be reused between compartments and refer to different module instances from different compartments. Um, and because of that, I was, uh, my, the, my first draft on this idea was to introduce another argument on the options bag that is, uh, that contains intercompartmental linkage um, as, uh, as tuples, uh, as two, as a, like, they call it aliases, for example, that contains tuples of compartment and full specifier in the target compartment. Uh, so it's a map of the full, the local full specifier to the remote compartment and the remote full specifier, um, which achieves the same thing, um, but requires uh, a, the addition of more API. Um, and also the um, some uh, a drawback. Another drawback of that approach is that then there becomes uh, it introduces the possibility of a, um, a precedence issue between um, between the module map and the alias map. Um, so a third possibility would be to dispose of the module map entirely and come up with um, a new kind of module map that is a, a local full specifier to a tagged union of either um, a, parent, a parent compartment full specifier, uh, a same compartment full specifier for local aliases, um, uh, a, a remote compartment and full specifier alias, um, as well as a, um, uh, a full specifier to actual instance of module namespace. Which is complicated. Was, yeah. Um, so part of my concern here is the ability to run stuff ahead of time. Um, the usage of object identity is problematic for nodes loader designs. And it, it, we tried to solve it several times and had a variety of issues. That's why we started just saying we're going to use strings for our cache keys. Um, I'll need to think on this. Um, I, I think there might be an alternative design. The, uh, the problem, like you said, about a full specifier not being cross compartment um, is interesting to me um, because that would just mean compartment needs to be paired with full specifier potentially or some other thing like you were talking about. Uh, but I need to think on it. So far, if, if you do not need anything to run ahead of time, this seems okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, another, there's another thing that came up when we first uh, started examining, it was actually in one of these meetings, first started examining using the module namespace object for this purpose, uh, is that uh, it's clear what use of the module namespace, um, I'm sorry, the module map, it's clear uh, what use of the module map involves granting authority and what authority it grants. Um, if you use uh, a parent full specifier name, you're only mentioning the static module to be reinstantiated from scratch in the new compartment. Uh, if you use the module namespace object, then you're getting all of the authority that that module will export. And the clearest object to, so that you're, you, so that everybody understands that you would, that, that that's the authority you're granting uh, would be the module namespace object itself. I would agree. Um, so, Nothing seems particularly wrong except for the ahead of time concern, mm -hmm. um, which may be fine for this. So, um, can you expound on the ahead of time concern? So, nodes uh, loaders were built with tooling in mind such that Webpack or TypeScript or anything could run ahead of time using a similar or, for the most part, the same API and create their full uh, graphs of modules. Yes. yes. If we use... I, I'd say that that is the motivating requirement for this. Uh, if we do use a module namespace object itself, um, 
I am just very unclear on how they would do that. So uh, I, uh, so I have, I've implemented this in the shim. Um, and the way that we ended up doing it was uh, with more trickery with weak maps behind the scenes. Um, so well, the, the proposal I described where the module map was uh, a map of full specifiers to a tagged union is effectively what the implementation is doing behind the scenes. It's looking at these tuples of compartment and uh, uh, a compartment and full specifier um, uh, duples. Uh, and uh, the way it obtains the duple for a module namespace object is by reaching into the weak map behind the scenes. So every, um, every module namespace object that's instantiated gets associated with its compartment and full specifier um, through this weak map. Um, and this weak map is how the compartment constructors communicate to each other about how to link the, uh, how, to, how to interlink. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, uh, which has some downsides, right? Because if, if, uh, if you have compartments from separate realms that do not share or, or multiple instances of the same shim, but from different realms, they're not going to close over the same weak map, um, which will mean that they can't, uh, they don't recognize each other's module namespace objects as being valid links. Uh, um, in current engines, at least, it's very unsafe to um, cross what we're calling realms with linkage. Mm -hmm. uh, it technically works in V8 some, but it leaks memory. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure engines want to support cross realm linkage. That's interesting. Uh, realms have separate GCs. Uh, not exactly, but they do have context specific storage attached to them in which the uh, script cache and a few other things are attached to it. What is, so what they is... only GC stuff when what they call the V8 context dies. What we're effectively calling a realm. Wasn't cross-realm linkage kind of the keystone of the V8 team's argument against tail call optimization? I don't know. Was it? I don't remember that one. Hmm. They couldn't figure okay. out how to make those two things work together. So um, as I was describing the tagged union approach, it occurred to me that um, uh, while I was implementing this, uh, and to be clear, Mark, uh, we already landed a mistake of mine, I've realized. Um, mm -hmm. And that is <laughs> that uh, I misinterpreted the full specifier to full specifier on module map to mean an alias within, the, within itself and uh, did not implement the um, reinstantiate oh. a module from the parent compartment because we don't have parent compartments yet in the shim, um, which which mean, but but in in my defense, having an alias within your own compartment is a feature that is necessary for um, for a faithful emulation of uh, of node style packages. Um, so you uh, haven't gotten to compartment yet in the PRs that I've reviewed. So where in the PRs I reviewed did I miss this? It would have been in the module load phase, where it follows aliases, um, but. It's fine. I'll make a note of it and come back and just remove it until we need the, and until we can add the feature. Okay. Um, but but that comes. To, but the but the reason I bring it up is because I think it's a valid feature to have, and we don't have a means to introduce it because we would need to be able to distinguish a string that means from parent compartment and string that means um, in same compartment. And in same compartment isn't expressible with the module namespace trick. Um, because one must have the compartment object in order to create it. Um, which might turn the, which might turn the course of this conversation. Um, because if we have to revisit the API module map in, a, in order to enable both of those features, it might be um, an opportunity to visit other design, uh, design ideas. Yeah, um, I think you're right. I think we overlooked that in our discussion of module map. I think I'm not even sure. I bet I think that you can fake it by creating a proxy module 
um, but I'm not sure using the ex uh, the export star from module trick. Um, and then there's also the case that we might also want to be able to inject a, a host object as a module um, because we also need to have a story for how to in, uh, how to introduce something like an attenuated file system, an, an attenuated version of the node FS module um, uh, into a compartment. And I don't think that we have a story for that yet. I am confused on this. What is the, where we decided that we're okay having the, um, import names, the, the full specifier, import namespace, mm -hmm. for a compartment be compartment-wide so that individual, so that we're not controlling um, the import namespace on a module-by-module -module basis. Uh, uh, we're only controlling it uh, on a compartment basis. So what is the case that we're missing? Uh, so one case, the, the one case is suppose that somebody in their package JSON aliases uh, a full specifier to a different full specifier, which is possible through main and uh, 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 I, I think- is this, is this aliasing within one compartment? Uh, that's true. It's not. It's uh, the aliasing only exists at the surface. Um, it, it only affects the presentation. I've written ones where you could have internal aliases, but this is not the case in Node. Okay. So, I, so I don't think this is a counterexample. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how do we propose to um, do the other example? The example of an attenuate and in injecting an attenuated FS module. Oh, uh, that one's straightforward. Um, uh, the, uh, the attenuator is in a namespace where when it imports FS, it gets the more powerful FS, not necessarily the real one, just a more powerful one that it's attenuating because the, the, uh, this logic composes. Uh, and uh, it itself um, uh, produces a namespace by which the name SF in some other compartment is populated. So uh, when compartment A uses the name FS, uh, it's referring to the module namespace of the attenuator in module B. Okay. And when, yeah. How do you inject the original fully powered file system into a compartment? The, um, so let's say we want uh, it to be uh, in compartment B. Uh, so uh, if FS is represented by a module namespace object, uh, then you uh, use that when you create compartment B. Uh, how do you construct the module namespace object from the, the a non namespace object? Okay. So this goes to the issue of uh, initial authority. Where does initial authority come from? Mm -hmm. uh, so the start compartment is running uh, in the world as it, uh, as it exists without compartments and has access, you know, can, can be born with, with all of the access that it would normally have. So mm -hmm. let's start off by, by hypothesizing how does the code in the start compartment have the power to interact with the, with the file system? Um, in the case of the shim, it does so by importing it from nodes module system. Okay, so the code in the start compartment uh, is in a namespace where, the na where if it imports the name FS, uh, it gets the power to manipulate the file system. Therefore, it can import uh, star as X from FS 
and reify that as a module namespace object. Uh, and then it can take that module namespace object and use it to set up the module map for compartment B. Mm -hmm. what, what does reify as a module namespace object mean? Uh, uh, it means um, uh, uh, it means turn it into an explicit object. So you're taking the set of the set the, the, the power exported by the power exported by the FS module collectively and turning it into a simple object that represents all of that power. Mm -hmm. uh, so reify just means to take take some abstract concept and turn it into a single object that in a first class way represents that concept. So, so the implication for the shim code is that the shim will need to be able to take an, an, an arbitrary real object that it has received in the module map and not recognizing it as a module namespace of its own kind because it's not the same kind of module namespace that the compartment constructs. Um, be able to treat that as a module namespace that it can then introduce to other modules inside of the container. Inside right, all of the, right, all the modules that are in the namespace of the start compartment, uh, all of those need to be reifiable as module namespaces that can be used in module maps. Which, which is to say that we need to have a, a facility for taking arbitrary objects and then um, lifting them into becoming module namespaces inside of a compartment. Uh, why does that follow? Um, because there's nothing special about them. Uh, from the perspective of the compartment shim, there's nothing special or distinguishing about a module namespace obtained from node um, from any other object. Mm. Mm. So um, there are ways you can try to detect if something is a module namespace object. Are, are we seeking to allow that, or are we just seeking to allow conversion from an object into a module namespace? So we added synthetic modules, roughly, uh, to various parts of stuff when looking at WebAssembly, um, which roughly do that. They take an object and convert it into a module namespace. Mm -hmm. Um, is are we just looking to expose that? I do think that we need to have a facility for creating synthetic module namespaces, specifically as as well for um, inter um, uh, it, it, for linking with WASM in particular. Um, question though then is uh, how much of the specialness of a module namespace needs to be. Um, expressible for uh, for WASM, like for example, like does WASM need to be able to, to uh, propagate a live binding into a, into a node, uh, into, pardon, into a, a compartment's module namespace? Um, um, WASM bindings are not live. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can agree that most cases will not be. Um, so just having a way to take an object and create a, mo a synthetic immutable not even necessarily immutable, but um, like a, re a, a read-only um, synthetic module namespace would be sufficient for our purposes. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the one observed mutation to the, to the exported variables themselves, uh, which will continue to be the case, uh, is coming out of temporal dead zone. Um, but because um, uh, that, that's distinct from the live binding issue. Um, but yeah, I don't expect anybody else to reproduce the, the live binding mistake. Okay, um, this guy, uh, sorry, this goes a little bit to last week's discussion where we're talking about the exoticness of module namespace objects. Because um, the approach I took in Microbium was just to say uh, a module namespace object is any object. So there's not, there's not, it, there's not really a distinction between, there's no need to turn an object into a module namespace object. So if you wanted to attenuate the FS module, for example, uh, you, could, you can do that just by a simple object to object transformation. And the result is, an ob is a module namespace object because all objects are potentially module namespace objects. 
there's no need to reify it or sort of promote it to a module namespace object. Is there any reason why we can't just do that? Yeah, that, that, that actually, I was, I was going to ask a variation on exactly that same question, which is what is a, what is a module namespace object got that a regular object ain't? Yeah, um, in the con this is perhaps particular to our shim implementation, but um, module name uh, module instances which contain module namespaces internally to our shim have some capabilities that a plain object would not have, particularly that they can project live bindings out into other modules that import them, uh, which is necessary for our implementation um, because a uh, a live binding isn't just a shared memory slot between multiple modules. It's actually something where um, we observe the mutation in the originating mod, uh, module and then propagate it out with a callback to all of the uh, all of the modules that import it. Could, could we do the same thing with the getter uh, instead of a proxy? So. Um, Internally, the shim could observe the, the, the properties on the, the given module namespace object and construct a new one that has getters that wraps the original. That's um, a possibility. I think, that, um, I think that our motivation was prim primarily around the performance difference between um, using a getter and just having a variable in scope. Uh, yeah, and, and this might be, again, a place where the shim goes one way and the proposal goes another way. Yeah, um, uh, the, the detail that the, the proposal would not need to know about, I think. Yeah. So the, the fact that the module namespace object stands for the pair of a compartment and full specifier, uh, what what use do we make of that? Because if we said module namespace could be an arbitrary object, then obviously it no longer has a necessary correspondence with compartment comma full specifier. Mm -hmm. Yes, the only thing that you can do with that that you can't do with a normal object is have a logical link without, uh, without, executing, uh, without executing a module in another compartment to obtain that reference. Okay. Okay. How so, does the, so, sorry. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm just trying to understand this distinction for ahead of time processing for like bundling and that, that you, uh, I mean, for any, um, uh, well, if, if a module, um, if, a, if a module in a compartment imports another module and the, the import hook uh, is a dynamic, it, it resolves dynamically what that is, then how, how does any ahead of time processing occur at all uh, for, you know, determining what that is and performing linking without running any code? Or uh, yes. maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, uh, I, I follow you, um, which, which gets to the next thing I'm likely to ask for after, <laughs> after this, which would be a, uh, for a compartment.load method. Um, so if I were to implement something like Cessify, uh, let's call, I mean, Browserify or, you know, some bundler like that, and let's call it Cessify for, for purposes of the discussion. Um, in order to implement that, I would need to either, I would need to do one of two things. One is I would need to do all of the things that are, that the compartment does internally for collect, for loading, uh, loading modules in the presence of import hooks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or I could try to use the compartment, uh, the compartment API to, use, to reuse that logic, if you follow. There's a compartment, the compartment, in, uh, the compartment API necessarily implements the process of fetching a dependency, analyzing its shallow dependencies, and then obtaining, and then loading its transitive dependencies before you can execute any of it, right? But this is, so you, part. You're saying that Cessify would execute dynamic code in the outer compartment in order to resolve the imports of the, of the inner compartment? What I'm suggesting is that it would be uh, 
it would be a requirement for any such tool that it not execute any of that code. But how does it invoke load if it's not dynamically invoking code? Um, again, the, the way this, the, what this would look like is yes, a specify implementation where say it reads your package lock and then walks your package lock and creates a compartment for every package JSON in your, in your application, right? Um, and in order to create those compartments, it needs to be able to thread the public uh, modules from the dependency modules into the, in, uh, into the imported module namespace of each compartment, right? Um, and you can do that entirely by analyzing the package JSON snippets from in the package lock, right? Um, but uh, with the API as it stands today, in order to in order to construct that, you would need to import um, you would in, need to import the all of the entry points of your uh, of your dependency packages in order to obtain the module namespaces to thread into the module map of the dependee, right? Which would which, threading into the module map is is at runtime, right? So the bundler is not doing this. Um, so the bundler needs to be able to do this too in order to explore the working set and determine which files need to be in the bundle. I'm, I'm still not following. I mean, surely the, the module map, uh, I, can con I can create code that constructs a module map that dynamically constructs some string that refers to some outer module. Um, and it's impossible for static analysis to determine what module that is ahead yeah. of time. It is possible to do that with the compartment API, but from outside. Uh, so uh, the expectation is with something like Sessify, we're not talking about client code using the compartment API. We're talking about using the compartment API to assemble a, a, a statically known set of compartments. And the, the statically known set of compartments is described in something like package lock.json. So uh, let me say, I'm not getting this at all. Uh, and um, I'm wondering how postponable this is. Oh, it certainly is. Um, yeah, we only have 10 minutes. Uh, this, is, this is stuff that will happen design discussions over the next week anyway, I think. Is there anything that this hook would do that user code using the compartment API cannot do? Um, essentially, the alternative that we there are two courses that are that are actionable. Um, they're both they're both equally valid. One of which is to um, use the compartment API in order to implement Sessify, or reproduce the behaviors that are in the implementation of the compartment API in order to in order to implement Sessify. Does that make sense? So I uh, so my question is about the first of those options. Mm -hmm. uh, can you implement a, um, uh, can, can the, the functionality that you have in mind for bundling and unbundling and all the rest of it, um, uh, whatever that functionality is, uh, can you use the compartment, a given compartments without this new API? Um, uh, given compartments, can you implement that functionality straightforwardly outside the, the outside of the compartments using the compartment API. Uh, you can't, no. Okay, then I don't understand it yet. Yeah, uh, the compartment API would need new features in order to be able to implement something like Sessify, in order to be useful in helping implement something like Sessify. Um, would, uh, it would help me. I don't know if it would help others if we if we could have uh, if we could draft up a concrete example, like a simple a simple um, application with whatever two modules and two compartments or whatever, and say, okay, this this is a scenario which we want to bundle, and this is how a bundler would would do it using load. Um, would would that be possible to do? Yes, for sure. Okay, yeah, an example would help me a lot as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I could do that now by analogy to another project I've done in the past. 
Um, but I think that that would be less useful and more confusing. Um, no, so what, 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 what would help me is as simple as possible of a self-contained example, you know, mm -hmm. involving, you know, Alice, Bob and Carol or something. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I can do that. All right. So well, let's, ta let's table this until next week and I'll, um, uh, I'll propose uh, a, a concrete example of a case that would, uh, that would need this feature. Good. And now, Calvert, I will get back to reviewing your code. Ah, you're muted again. All right. Um, I think that that's enough for me. Unless any, uh, unless anybody wants to talk about something else. Oh, let's uh, let's stop the recording. <laughs>